good morning from my side. Uh, I wish a warm welcome to all of you uh, who are interested in finance in EU project funds. My name is Maria Shalas Pasic, and I will be moderator for all parallel sessions dedicated to Horizon Europe Finance as one of the topic uh, of this meeting. Uh, let me introduce myself in short here for uh, those who don't know me uh, yet. I work as project manager at University of Belgrade School of Electrical Engineering for more than seven years. At the same time, I uh, have worked as national contact point for financial and legal matters in FP7 and Horizon 2020 program in Serbia. Uh, I have professional experience in training beneficiaries on one side and practical experience in management and implementing waste a number of uh, research innovation, higher education projects. As an economist, I was a proud leader, uh, working group two, uh, dedicated to finance in uh, one of the most uh, prominent network researchers, uh, managers, administrators, financed by EU. Uh, probably you, it's a well-known best practice. Uh, also, I wish to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Joanna Roots from Yarma. She will support me in this moderator role during the two days uh, meeting. Thank you, Joanna, in advance. Uh, and now, uh, first of all, uh, let's introduce the house rules. I hope that you can see it on the screen. Uh, the meeting is recording. It, what it means, it means that uh, when you switch your cameras on, you might appear in recording. So you can choose uh, to have your camera on or off. Uh, use the chat fu function for asking questions, share information, comments. We will collect all your questions and of course give our best to provide answers during the meeting. Anyway, if left unanswered the questions, we will send them to call VG2 after the meeting. Stick to the time suggested in agenda, 50 minutes for presentation and five minutes for discussion. Let's all try to stick this time schedule for the best organization of all our parallel session. Kindly note that the moderators will remind you of the time availability at, le at least two minutes before your time is up. When there is a room for live discussion, please raise your hand. But to know that live discussion is planned for the very end of each session, except if we need additional clarification for your questions. In that case, some of us moderators need a Okay, I now I have a great, great pleasure to introduce presenter for our first session, Peringe Anderson. He is a senior advisor in financial and project management of European project and Norwegian University of Science and Technology. His experience comprises all EU uh, framework programs since FP6, along with various other research funding programs. He has actively involved in the ARMA uh, since 2008. He was an active participant in best practice and remains engaged in follow-up activities in all European best practice network. In this session, he will speak on how to avoid paid falls when budgeting for Horizon Europe, taking a look at the basic rules and principles that should be taken in account when budgeting for Horizon Europe proposals. Peringe, floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Maria. There are, when yes. we're discussing uh, budgeting uh, proposals for Horizon, uh, Horizon Europe proposals, uh, these are some of the issues I suggest we should uh, take a look at. Uh, briefly look at basic rules for budgeting, uh, then, uh, just briefly show you uh, what the budget looks like for, or the budget table looks like for uh, Horizon Europe. Uh, some changes moving from Horizon 2020 to Horizon Europe. Uh, and also looking at terminology in the changes, uh, cost categories that uh, either have disappeared or have, have been added. Uh, also, uh, there, are, there are new additions to the budget table regarding income. Uh, a few highlights of uh, changes in how you calculate your costs. 
suggestion on how you might approach developing your own budget tools uh, for this new framework program. A uh, few keywords about uh, how you might go about budgeting proposals as a coordinator under Horizon Europe. A couple of uh, highlights of things that, to me at least, seem unclear at the moment, uh, looking at the present uh, documents available from, from the Commission, and the suggestions of where you might look for guidance, basically. So uh, when you approach new proposals under Horizon Europe, and you're going to work on a budget, basically you have to work with what you have, in terms of guidelines. Uh, we all know that there is no annotated model grant agreement published yet. Uh, in the pre pre previous framework program, Horizon 2020, that document, as I remember, was about 100, sorry, 850 pages. Uh, so that is where a lot of people went for guidance from uh, financial rules. Uh, obviously, the model grant agreement, uh, the first version of which has been published, cannot go into detail about all kinds of financial questions that you might have when you work on budgeting and when you work on reporting. Uh, so we had to work on what we have. Uh, it's important to know the basic criteria for what makes costs applicable under the new framework program. Uh, there is Article 6 in the Model Grant Agreement, uh, which summarizes that from a legal point of view. Uh, we need to understand the terminology in Horizon Europe, which is relevant for budgeting, and also know what the cost ca categories are and which costs fit where in these categor categories. Uh, and as well, we need, need to know how to calculate costs. This, I mean, you're not supposed to or expected to study this. As you can see, the budget table in the model grant agreement for Horizon Europe is very wide. It has a lot of columns. Uh, this is not even readable. Uh, so it just tells us that there are a lot of cost categories available in the I have another presentation of this uh, from a, a proposal template from one of the first calls that have already been out this year. This was from the uh, EIC Pathfinder open call, which closed in, uh, last month. Again, we see uh, a lot of cat uh, category columns and cat categories going forward. And uh, this also continues on, on uh, the next page. Um, and I'll summarize, uh, have a few comments about these later on. Again, it might seem daunting to try, try to navigate this landscape uh, with all those columns, all these categories and so on. Uh, so we'll try to summarize things a little bit for you. Uh, but I put out the question mark here. It is said in the corporate model grant agreement that, okay, you have a budget table which is sort of uh, supposed to apply to most programs. But of course, there, there is a provision that some work programs may have their own budget tables. And indeed, uh, so far, that's a fact. Uh, already in the ERC calls that were open uh, with deadlines in April, we could see that the budget table for the ERC proposals was roughly like for Horizon 2020. Uh, for MSCA, uh, Marie Skoldowska Reactions, uh, no work program have, has been published yet. So uh, we don't know exactly what the budget table would look like, but we can speculate that it would be to a large extent like for the previous framework program, uh, but be prepared for modifications. So then, uh, what are key changes when we move from one framework program to the next, from Horizon 2020 to Horizon Zero? There is some language that has changed, some terminology. 
something that was called one thing in Horizon 2020 is now called something else. Another thing is that cost categories that we had in the previous framework program, we cannot find them anymore but new cost categories have been added and we need to understand those. Uh, third thing is that there are certain changes in how to cal calculate costs uh, in those rules. So for terminology, uh, I've tried to highlight changes in terminology, changes in, in what things are called that are relevant for budgeting. Uh, for, first of all, and this is when you budget your own budget as a beneficiary, but also uh, working as a coordinator, what to keep track of for the whole consortium. Uh, one thing that has changed is the name of the cost category at other direct costs, which is now called purchase costs. It's basically just a name change. Uh, also within that category, what used to be called other goods and services is now called other goods, works and services. Again, mostly a name change. Then the third change is a little bit more complicated. Uh, we had uh, in Horizon 2020, the term in-kind contributions by third parties uh, with different varieties. In Horizon Europe, that is different. And we'll go into greater detail about this uh, later on in this uh, meeting in a separate presentation. Uh, but briefly summarized here, we have in-kind contributions by third parties provided free of charge, uh, which is what um, is now defined as in-kind contributions by third parties. Uh, other contributions by third parties are not, which uh, are provided against payment are not called in-kind contributions anymore. Uh, a four, fourth change is the term linked third party, which is now renamed affiliated entity to bring the terminology for Horizon Europe in line with uh, terminology in other EU programs. Uh, similarly, what was called international partner in uh, Horizon 2020 is now called associate partner. Uh, this is primarily relevant uh, when you're co a coordinator and you have to take care of the budget for the consortium as a whole. Uh, then it's also important to know what are the roles of uh, each legal entity that's involved in the project. About the cost categories that have gone and have been added. Uh, I mentioned uh, one cost, cost category, which uh, was present in the budget table and also in the financial statement template for Horizon 2020, uh, which is called estimated cost of income contributions not used on premises. Uh, again, uh, this is not the place to go into detail about that category. It was used in order to uh, correct the calculation of in indirect costs, basically. Uh, beyond that is a subject of a different presentation. Uh, then there are um, new cost, cost categories in, uh, well, all of them are not new, but they are all added to this corporate model grant agreement budget table um, under the heading other cost categories. And those that are marked in red on this table are available only in certain calls for certain uh, work programs and not for all. So you won't see them, you won't see all of these cost categories under the heading other cost categories in the budget table for your proposal in the EU portal necessarily. Uh, but you may see them depending on the call, basically. So, Peringa, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt you. You have two minutes more for presentation. Two minutes? Yes, okay. please. Yeah. So, uh, basically, uh, another thing that's new in the budget table is the uh, that there are columns for income 
not just costs. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'll just highlight those for you now. Uh, changes in cost calculation rules. We'll have another presentation on personal cost later on, so I'll, I'll skip that. Uh, but there are two highlights that uh, we need to think about. It's the, the change from hourly rates to daily rates and the issue of project-based remuneration. For income contributions by third parties, again, separate of a, a subject of a separate presentation, but the change here in cost calculation is that uh, you add, uh, now you add 25% for indirect costs on top of those costs because you're supposed to only have direct costs to, to start with. For internal invoice goods and services, uh, Wolfram is going to speak about that. For the cost calculation, uh, this uh, the key here is that you will uh, they add, they will, uh, sorry, uh, indirect costs are supposed to be included in, uh, in the unit cost for internal invoice goods and services. So no additional 25% for indirect costs for those uh, costs anymore. Uh, I made a note here at the bottom of my presentation from the ERC calls this year, uh, there was a budget tip saying that if you have costs from other parties, which are calculated on the unit cost basis and, and invoiced internally, you should put them under internal invoice goods and services, which was strange to me, but that's what it said. Uh, equipment cost. Uh, Again, subject of a different presentation, but keep in mind this option for uh, costs of assets under construction and how to budget those. Um, and then uh, there's a change in the tr threshold for uh, CFS, for certificate of financial statement. Yeah, uh, Perengi, we, we have to stop here. Uh, we yeah. have one question for you before our the next session. Uh, this is a question from Madalena Tognava. Are the former contributions by third parties against the payment now include as works under other costs? Uh, basically, you have to include it in the cost category uh, that fits the cost. If it's personnel, you could include uh, uh, income contributions against payment under seconded persons. Uh, other uh, other contributions, uh, non-personnel, non-cash contributions against payment, you put them under the relevant purchase cost category. Okay, thank, uh, thank you very much for all uh, the priceless information and a brief overview of the uh, changes. We will go in details further uh, with uh, everything what you mentioned uh, during this presentation. Uh, we have to stop here and go forward in the same direction in how to avoid the paid falls when budgeting horizon Europe. But uh, let me introduce our panelists and presenters for uh, the next session. Uh, Wolfram uh, Rinek is deputy head of uh, the research support department at Medical University Innsbruck, Austria. Uh, there he is responsible for international funding programs as well as programs funding cooperation projects between university and industry. He started supporting uh, applicants for European framework programs 20 years, 23 years ago during the fourth framework program. The first program uh, Austria could take part after entire uh, the European Union. During six framework program, he was a national contact point for whole, uh, health program. Today, he, he will present the development of the reimbursement rules for uh, internal invoice costs in Horizon Europe projects. In same session, Peringe will tell us what happened to in-kind contribution by third parties. He will uh, indicate what key changes in these rules and what may in part explain these changes. Uh, Wolfram, floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Maria. So thank you very much for your kind introduction. And also thank you, Inge, for this uh, great overview over the um, novelties in the uh, new framework program, Horizon Europe. So I will go a little bit in detail into the internally invoiced goods and services um, and try to, to uh, be as brief as possible. Um, the, this cost category is for us as medical university of uh, very, very high importance. So nearly 
all um, or most of the projects um, we are performing here, both on international and national uh, levels, include uh, some of those uh, internal um, internally invoiced costs. Um, and it was a long, long way from uh, the beginning of Horizon 2020 to the status we have now in, in Horizon Europe. So at the beginning of H2020, um, the system of those uh, internal invoice costs was changed completely. So the commission introduced um, the um, reimbursement of those costs under the normal cost categories. So um, we had to calculate, um, for example, our, our animal house, um, all the stuff there had now um, to um, fill their, their, their time sheets and every single piece of uh, feed stuff and whatever had to be um, uh, calculated under the respective uh, cost category, category, for example, uh, sorry, yeah, um, for example, um, the, the other cost category. So um, this made, this system then made it close to impossible for us uh, to calculate um, or, or to get th those costs, those internal um, invoice costs uh, reimbursable for our university as no stuff in, for example, the animal house would keep their time uh, sheets for each project uh, they are involved in. So, um, yeah, for the first years of, of uh, H2020, we could not get re reimbursed our internally invoiced costs. So it was a, a lot of lot of organizations then um, tried to uh, convince the commission to change the system. For example, the European uh, University Association um, and other organizations. And finally, they were successful. And from uh, begin of 2017, so mid of the uh, last framework program, um, they um, recognized that this uh, system was a huge problem for our universities and changed uh, the, the philosophy completely. So from this time on, um, our internal invoice cost could be reimbursed on the basis of unit costs, um, according to the usual accounting practices uh, of the organizations. Um, they, of course, those, those accounting practices must, be cons uh, must have been consistent for all sources of funding. So there was not possible to uh, have our own system for the European project. So the, um, cost, uh, the, the accounting practices have been um, um, applied for, for national funding, for regional funding, as well as for the European funding. Um, those um, costs and the unit costs and also the numbers of the units used in the, in the project um, had to be, in, uh, to be recorded in the, in the beneficiaries accounts. Um, and of course did not um, include any um, costs which, sorry, which were um, not <laughs> um, uh, included in other, which, which have been included in other budget categories. For example, again, uh, personal costs. So you cannot uh, use the same personal costs for the internal invoices and as well as for the, for the normal uh, project budget. And uh, those costs all, uh, also had been possibly um, adjusted by the beneficiary on the basis of um, budgeted or estimated uh, elements. But again, those uh, um, adjustments have to be uh, objective and verifiable um, by the beneficiary. And uh, those unit costs also excluded, of course, items which were not directly linked to the production uh, of those services or to the um, pro provision of those services and goods. So now um, the situation in the um, Horizon Europe in the new framework program, uh, as uh, Peringe already mentioned, uh, those costs are um, defined in the Article 6 and the cost category is the, uh, the category D2. And I, in my opinion, the definitions in the new um, model grant agreement are even more clear than uh, they have been in the, in the H2020 MGA. Okay, Wolfram, I just uh, to remind you, you have less than two minutes. Okay. okay. <laughs> so then I, uh, I skip I forgot very to, fast. to remember. Yeah, thanks. Um, the, the costs again have been uh, have to be recorded in the beneficiary accounts, uh, and of and, and again 
they will um, uh, use the, the usual accounting practices um, for those costs. And um, this, uh, um, uh, this, these costs need, of course, also um, be um, uh, directly connected to uh, the project. So I go I try to go quickly about it. <laughs> so what, what kind of costs we have here? So we have, of course, self-produced consumables, then specific uh, research devices, research facilities, which is uh, the most important point in our in, in university, and also premises for hosting the research specimens, like our animal house, uh, greenhouse aquarium, and, and so on. They must be directly connected to the project. This is the important point. They must be well documented, both for uh, the direct and the indirect costs um, of those services. And um, again, we have to use this methodology for all projects we have consistently. Uh, and as Benge already mentioned, it's also possible to uh, be applied in the ERC grants, uh, both for the regular and the additional funding. Uh, but they are not, not applicable um, for um, other projects using U, uh, unit costs like the transnational access uh, to research infrastructure or the virtual access to research infrastructures if they are available in the call. And this is the good news. <laughs> Usually by using the actual direct costs, uh, indirect costs, you get higher um, uh, reimbursement rates than the 25% which used to be, now, uh, to be used now. So this I go just quickly what we are uh, for what we are using those um, those costs. So this is mainly our animal house, but also our um, core facilities, which uh, can be accessed by all of our researchers within the, uh, our university. And finally, just uh, to conclude, uh, stay home messages. Um, the most important point is it must be well documented, and we are at the moment in the process um, to re document our system and recalculate them according to um, the, the actual indirect cost which can be used for now. Um, it must be evidence of the amount of the unit cost, uh, of the, the, the price of the unit cost, as well as uh, the amount of units um, used in the project. The beneficiary usual practice is much stronger accepted by the Commission now based on, on, on a new <laughs> Uh, philosophy of trust, and this is uh, for us at the moment, uh, it's an effort now, we have to do it uh, newly for our, uh, unit for our calculation of our core facilities, um, uh, that the 25% lump sum for the indirect costs cannot be included anymore, but we expect to get higher uh, reimbursement rates uh, by using our actual indirect costs. So okay. I had to be very Thank quick, you. so this is, uh, <laughs> Not the last yeah. slide. Thank you. But uh, first, we, we should have a floor to Peringe uh, for uh, uh, his presentation, and we will uh, uh, answer a question at the end. Peringe, you have maximum 10 minutes. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Wolfram, for your presentation. Uh, what was known under the name In Kind Contributions of the Parties in Horizon 2020 now. Uh, it, to one extent is a different animal, sorry, pardon the pun, in Horizon Europe. Um, so we'll briefly look at what happened to it uh, in Horizon Europe. Uh, just a brief reminder, we'll probably skip that. Uh, what was the definition in Horizon 2020? Uh, look at changes in definitions uh, and terminology and rules and how to budget uh, and report costs now. A uh, uh, couple of issues that, as far as I can see, are at the moment unclear in the guidelines. In Horizon 2020, we had uh, in the matrix to the left, uh, we had two dimensions which were relevant for income contributions by third parties. Uh, we had uh, two articles, one uh, which concerned uh, income contributions uh, free of charge and one was uh, against payment. And we also had to distinguish whether uh, between whether they were used in the official currencies or not. In Horizon Europe, uh, when you look at the terminology, it looks quite different. Uh, yeah, the, the outset at first glance, it looks like it's only re relevant in one box in that matrix. 
which is free of charge and used on the beneficiary premises. Uh, for all the other boxes in that matrix, uh, the, there is a question mark at first glance. Um, so briefly in the Horizon 2020, we had the two articles in grant agreement, uh, free of charge and against payment. We had also a column in the budget table and in the financial statement uh, called additional information uh, for indirect costs, uh, the, num the cost for income contributions not used on the premises. And the purpose of that was to correct the calculation of, to duck that number from the calculation of indirect costs. In Horizon Europe, uh, in Article 2 of the Model Grant Agreement, there are, is a set of definitions. And one term that's defined there is income contributions. And it's now called <clears throat> income contributions with the meaning of Article 2, uh, bracket 36 of the EU financial regulation from 2018, i.e., non financial resources made available free of charge. So actually this comes from the financial regulation, which was um, adopted in 2018, in August 2018, uh, where it says uh, in that same uh, article, income contribution means non-financial resources made available free of charge by third parties to a beneficiary. So, what happens here is that the rules for Horizon Europe are now aligned with the financial regulation. The financial regulation, by the way, is sort of the basic financial rules of everything uh, within the EU, uh, briefly summarized. So what about uh, what was called EU, uh, sorry, in-kind contributions against payment in Horizon 2020? Well, they're still eligible for funding, but they're not, they're not called in-kind contributions anymore. That, that is sort of uh, how to summarize it. In Horizon Europe, uh, you don't have separate articles about in-kind contributions in the model pantomime anymore. But within two articles, uh, there is some text about in-kind contributions. And remember, remember, this is only free of charge we're talking about. So in Article 6, which is about eligible costs, in Article 6.1, uh, there is more text than this, I'm, but I'm just highlighting one key term, uh, part of that text is <coughs> text, which says, provided that they concern only direct costs. In Horizon 2020, uh, that could be different. Uh, and in Article 9.2, it says, other third parties may give in kind of contributions to the action, i.e. personnel, equipment, other goods and working services, et cetera, which are free of charge if necessary for the implementation. In the budget table, you, you don't find anything about in kind of contributions anywhere, basically. So the key terminology that we're left with here is first of all, the term in kind of contributions by third party, which now means free of charge. The other is the term seconded persons, which you will find in the budget table for the grant. Okay, uh, bring every, you have two minutes more. Okay, thanks. Seconded persons is for personnel provided by third parties against payment. So it's only if it's against payment, you use that category, seconded persons. Um, so again, costs, uh, all the in, uh, sorry, all the con non-financial contributions by third party, whether it's free of charge, i.e. in fines or against payment, they may be eligible, but only as measured by the direct costs for the third party. And then you get 25% of indirect costs on top of that. So it's not no longer deducted from the calculation of the indirect costs with the 25% rate. Uh, so basically, uh, how do you budget it? If it's in kind, i.e. free of charge, you just use the same categories you, that you would use, the same cost categories that you would use if they, as if they were your own. If they're against payment, as I said, personnel goes under seconded persons, everything else goes under the quote unquote normal cost categories. Uh, for reporting the same thing twice, 
uh, but keep in mind that you also only report the cost as they were measured as direct costs for the third part, and then you calculate in the costs on top of that. Uh, there is no guidance yet, uh, that I can find yet which says can you indicate anywhere in your report that you had in kind contribution to a charge. So what's unclear at the moment, first of all, is whether this would have to be, if it's provided free of charge and you report them as costs, you also have to report them as revenue. Revenue is what's called the receipts in Horizon 2020, i.e. income generated already by the action. That's unclear at the moment. And the other, uh, one other thing that's uh, still unclear is whether these contributions by third parties will only be eligible if, eligible if they're used on the premises of the beneficiary, because this is linked to the fact that you get indirect costs on top. Thanks a lot. Okay, uh, thank you, Pering, a lot uh, for this presentation. Uh, we have uh, one uh, question uh, uh, in the chat box uh, from uh, Stashka, uh, Mrak Yannik, uh, who has verified uh, the calculation of indirect costs. Uh, this is a question for uh, Wolfram. Uh, yes, <clears throat> thank you for this question. Um, well, um, as I said, uh, the most important uh, thing or the most important aspect in this um, uh, in, in this field is that you have a very, very precise and good documentation, um, how you calculate both your indi indirect and direct costs. And then, of course, you need them for the calculation of your project budget. Um, in our case, uh, this is done by the uh, financial department of our university in uh, cooperation with the um, different core facilities we have. And then, of course, it uh, will be uh, controlled and checked by um, during the, the possible audit you, you will have um, if you are over the, the, um, the threshold. Um, and um, of course, the auditor will take your documentation, check them, and uh, verify them if they are valid. Okay, uh, thank you very much for presentation and uh, for questions. We have one question more. Uh, do you have an example for third party personnel costs free of charge? I think that this is uh, for uh, Peringe. Uh, depends on what you mean by example. Uh, um, I think there is an example mentioned in uh, one of the e documents I read somewhere where uh, for certain public entities, uh, you have an arrangement where. Uh, salaries for personnel are paid not by the legal entity, which is a beneficiary in the grant agreement, but by uh, public authorities. That is mentioned as one example somewhere in the EU documents. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your presentation and questions as well. Uh, we have to stop here and go forward in details about the novelty in Horizon Europe program and uh, its importance when budgeting application for Horizon Europe. In the following session, our panelists and presenters will be uh, Madalena Tognola, Primoz Petek, and Barbara Doric. Uh, Madalena Tognola is head of the grant office at the University of Bern in Switzerland. She has been uh, in research management for almost 20 years and uh, is a member of both ARMA and BESPRAC, of course, in BESPRAC in uh, VG2 Finance. Primoz Petek is involved, in, uh, uh, involved with uh, research management and administration since 2011, when uh, he joined Public Research Institute in Slovenia, Slovenian Forestry Institute. His work there is linked with finance, accounting, EU-funded projects, and other related areas of work. Uh, as a member of both network, BESPRAC and ARMA, he is uh, active in a different administration project where he develops uh, RMI related topics. Barbara Doric is involved uh, with uh, RMI since 2001. She's working at Faculty of uh, Mathematics and Physics, University of Ljubljana, Slovenia, as head of a research and development office since 2019. Sheen is involved in RMI pre-award and post-award project, best PRAC member since 2018. Today, panelists will speak on two financial aspects of Horizon Europe that should be considered earlier when preparing the budget. 
the re reduce the net amount for management and overheads in Maria Slodowska Kiri doctoral networks and clarifications regarding purchase of equipment. Uh, Madalena, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Maria. I feel like the Eurovision Song Contest now burn calling and sending 12 points to Norway and to Austria. Uh, yes, that's it. I feel the same. Well, um, dear colleagues, uh, I will have a very brief input uh, regarding changes in the Marie Skorowska Curie doctoral networks, which were formerly called the ITNs, the Innovative Training Networks. Uh, what's the issue? The Commission had too many applications of ITNs and decided to fund more by reducing uh, the cost of each project. And how to reduce the cost of each project? They reduced the number, the maximum number of fellows, of PhD students that can be employed in the normal Horizon Europe doctoral networks. I'm talking here especially about the normal doctorates, not industrial and not the joint. So uh, we had up to 15 PhD students in Horizon 2020. As you know, uh, there is a payment per unit, so per month, where one of the PhD students is employed. So we had 540 units. And now we have a maximum of 300, 360 units. That means 10 PhD students in Horizon Europe doctoral networks. What does it mean in terms of budget? Um, so first of all, there is also a reduction in the amount for the research and training cost for 200 euro per month. A smaller amount and less fellows, it means that the budget for research and training is going down. So if you think of research intensive doctorates, networks, um, molecular biology, for example, and then also creating trainings for everyone, now the budget is going down. It's 60% of what it used to be. So you might end up having less budget to hire external trainers. You have to find a way to uh, reduce the cost of summer schools. Um, yes, and well, uh, if you took reserves to pay the PhD students, you have a bit less here. Um, in the former best practice in the project, we had our financial guideline, guidelines from 2017, where we recommended uh, a split of the budget that was uh, for overhead and management into two halves to say, okay, with one half, you can give it to the institutions as overhead, and the other half would be centralized to fund the management of the project. So actually our jobs and our colleagues' jobs. Well, this recommendation might have to be reviewed in Horizon Europe because there is less uh, in general. The amount per se remains the same. It's still 1,200. But since the amount of fellows is going down, we end up with 432,000 euro for a whole project instead of 648. And so if we split it, and this is the, the slide where you could see the figure, you end up per year. So the, the amount that is available divided by four, if we split it 50% of 54,000 euro for management per year of a doctorate network. And this calls for me uh, to a reconsideration of uh, what can be done in terms of management and how to split the amounts. And this is it. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Madalena, a lot for a brief presentation. Uh, Primoz and Barbara, uh, floor is yours. OK, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, we are happy to present an interesting topic uh, called Equipment in Horizon Europe. Uh, my name is Primoz Petek, and I'm coming from Slovenia Forestry Institute. Uh, my co-presenter and colleague, Barbara Zdoric, is coming from University of Ljubljana, Faculty of Mathematics and Physics. Uh, before I hand over the stage to my colleague, I would underline that this presentation is made on the basis of uh, available Horizon Europe information. Uh, also, main Horizon 2020 guidelines were taken into consideration uh, for preparing this overview. Now, please, let's hear Barbara's insights. 
dear colleagues, um, welcome to our um, equipment um, uh, best track uh, slides. I would like to talk about um, equipment. Uh, when we are talking about equipment, this is one of the cost categories of the um, uh, Horizon Europe project. And uh, this cost category of equipment includes, you can buy uh, equipment new for the project. You can uh, use equipment that was bought before the project started, but uh, you have to uh, be aware that it's not yet fully depreciated. You can also use uh, infrastructure if it's, in, if it's foreseen in the, in the call, or you can use other F, F, um, assets where applicable. Next slide, please. What are the uh, eligible equipment? What is the eligible equipment? Equipment was foreseen in the application. If there are any changes regarding this equipment, you should contact co your coordinator or project officer. Equipment can be charged on the project directly, um, but if it's your usual practice, to uh, consider sand durable equipment as uh, overheads, you should cover them from your 25% uh, uh, rate of indirect costs. Next slide, please. What are the eligible equipment costs? As said, the equipment is eligible if it was foreseen in the call in the, call, in the project application. You should follow best uh, value for money principle, sometimes it is appropriate to, to, uh, to follow the lowest price. Equipment costs may also include the cost necessary to ensure that the asset is in good health, that you can use it um, as you would like to use it. So um, these costs are also eligible. So are the cost uh, related duties and taxes, such as non-deductible value added tax. Next slide, please. Uh, we have some uh, different available options how to, cha um, to charge equipment to the project. Um, depreciation costs are by default eligible. If foreseen, uh, you can by exception use full cost. You can also use uh, renting or leasing of equipment or cost of equipment infrastructure uh, contributed in kind against payment. Next slide, please. Uh, depreciation is um, an, a method of the uh, accounting method. And it means that you can, um, you, you will charge the, the equipment cost to the project uh, over, his, over its useful life. So you cannot charge an equipment to the project um, in one year if you will, if you can use the equipment over a few uh, years. Barbara, sorry for interruption. Can you uh, go to, to change in the presenter uh, presentation mode, your presentation because of better uh, visibility? Um, sorry, where? Um, it is not a uh, presentation mode. Yeah, I think it's plus, <laughs> plus F5. Sorry. Can you do that? Uh, is everything okay? Now it's great. Thank okay, you. Okay, sorry. Much. I wasn't um, looking at myself, so I, <laughs> okay. Um, um, can you go for, uh, on, Primoz, please? Okay. Um, we, uh, we have some regularities um, um, for the depreciation. This must be, must be actually incurred costs. Uh, I said it must be your um, usual accounting practice. You can only charge a portion of depreciation. Um, it means the portion of the rate as uh, of usual of uh, your actual use. This is only eligible. Uh, you can only charge the cost incurred um, during the project, not before, not after the project. Depreciation cannot um, be um, um, higher than the purchase cost of the equipment. Uh, the cost of renting or leasing equipment is also eligible, but it must not exceed the um, usual depreciation costs. Um, also be aware that you should have some supporting documentation for the use of the equipment. Uh, usually we have the equipment usage log. Also you can have timesheets for the equipment. 
and uh, be aware that the use of equipment consists with the project staff working okay. on the project. I have to remember, remind you that you have two minutes more for presentations. Okay. Because we, we received the questions, I want okay. to discuss it. Primos, uh, it's, it's your uh, uh, work. Okay, Barbara, Barbara, thanks. Uh, regarding full cost option, we have to be attentive uh, to the fact that the purchase of equipment, infrastructure, other assets are specifically bought for the action. Uh, further on, such purchase should be recorded as a fixed asset. And also full, cast, uh, full cost of renting leasing are eligible. Uh, then we have two hybrid options. First is such where depreciation costs are primarily foreseen and full cost option is added. And then we have second hybrid option where full cost option is primarily foreseen and the depreciation uh, option is added. Uh, we have also an uh, option where uh, equipment purchase outlay is only partially capitalized. That means only a part of it is recognized as an asset. In this case, capitalized portion may be considered within equipment cost category. This is of course uh, possible if full cost option is, is available. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the expense portion may be considered within purchase cost category. Of course, uh, expenditures are recognized in acquiring uh, period. Uh, an omnipresent question may arise here, and that is, can accounting treatment dictate financial reporting? By our opinion, this may be the case in certain circumstances, although we do not think that this should be uh, the case. And then at the end, we're left uh, with special features that, that are linked with equipment costs. Uh, there could be a case where an asset that we acquired for a project uh, is after project completion or completion of a work package, package sold on a market. Uh, in such case, we would expose a prescription which says uh, that equipment costs are eligible only if used for the action. Uh, consequently, proceeds of such say should lower equipment uh, eligible costs. Uh, then we have equipment maintenance costs. Uh, we should be aware that maintenance co costs are linked with usage of equipment. That means, uh, let's say, cleaning, calibrating, testing, and, uh, and so on. And we should foresee these costs already at budget preparation phase. Uh, currently, there are no large research infrastructure uh, mentioning and also no full capacity filter that could be mentioned in existing Horizon Europe uh, documents. Uh, and for wrap up, we have low value assets. These uh, should be recorded uh, as cost within beneficiary business years, but of course, uh, accepted accounting principles should be taken into uh, consideration. Uh, so uh, thank you for your attention. Now, if there are any unanswered questions, please uh, do ask. Great. Uh, we have a few questions uh, in the chat. Uh, First, first, uh, can we consider purchasing a book of books as equipment following our institutional rules? Well, I would say uh, uh, that you have to consider, uh, you have to, to check uh, if it is um, to to um, to finish to do your project as uh, expect uh, as you um, you you've done the uh, you write the application. So um, it's not only the, your usual practice, but also you have to consider what you, you write in the application. So it's not a yes or a no question. I think you should consider uh, what uh, are the books for the project or, you know. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Uh, what are the exceptions to be able to claim the full costs uh, of an equipment? Can you share example, please? Oh, uh, maybe, maybe I can try to answer, answer this question. Um, well, of course, uh, full cost, I, I think, okay, first, one thing we've maybe forgot to mention is that you have to, of course, make uh, some close lead before uh, you go into the story. Uh, and of course, uh, you have to, um, same, have some logs or some some evidence you know that these costs will be will be uh, properly claimed um, so I think if, if it's full cost option if it is uh, uh, allowed 
then I think you need uh, proper evidence that you use it only for, for this project, you know. Um, so I, I hope I quickly managed to answer the question, otherwise I, I, can, I can do some additions. Okay, I, I, I cannot find any uh, more questions in the chat. Uh, thank you very much on your presentations. Um, now we are moving on our uh, last but not least session for today. Uh, in this session, Peringi Anderson will uh, discuss how to approach and calculation of the personnel cost during the budgeting for proposal in the first calls under Horizon Europe program in view of current available information. Uh, together with him, our colleague Elena Ioannidou will again overview of the main uh, features and provisions of the personal costs under Horizon Europe Cooperative Grant Agreement. Also, the main differences from Horizon 2020 to Horizon Europe will present in, presented, emphasizing uh, the simplification of calculations. Uh, Elena Ioannidou has more than 15 years uh, experience in managing and administration of research grants, both national and international, including European funding grants. In 2004, she was assigned to set up the research office uh, of the Cyprus Institute of Neurology and Genetics, and since then she runs it. Today, she provides her expertise from the pre-aware to post-aware stage and for the last five years is also offering advice, supporting the protection and exploitation of intellectual property rights. Uh, Elena and Peringe, floor is yours. Good morning to all the participants and thank you for uh, being here and uh, have the patience uh, with us. Uh, this is a snapshot of uh, Horizon 2020 and how we calculate the personnel cost under Horizon 2020. As you can see, we had a lot of calculations, a lot of uh, options uh, on the actual productive hours. And uh, so the, uh, the Commission decided that it needed to, uh, to move forward and uh, change uh, that so they incorporated the corporate approach uh, where they attempted to simplify and harmonize everything under Horizon uh, Europe. Uh, can we move forward, please? The next slide. Okay, the main difference now is that uh, the concept of uh, the annual productive hours is. Uh, uh, discontinued as well as the last closed financial year in our calculations and the hourly rates. And uh, so uh, what is uh, adapted? Can you please? Uh, uh, okay. So now we will uh, uh, follow the current calendar year uh, that will be implemented, the daily rate approach across all programs of Horizon 2020. And uh, so the formula will be easier and reduce all the errors and administrative burden. Uh, next slide, please. Now, as I told you, the Commission adopted uh, in June 2020 uh, the Corporate Model Grant Agreement across all law funding programs. Uh, of course, certain options are available uh, to be adapted to each program according to the specific rules of each program, and the daily approach will be uh, followed across all programs. Next slide, please. Uh, the objective uh, of the corporate model grad, uh, of the corporate grant agreement was to harmonize and standardize everything in all programs, consistent interpretation in all programs, and the integration of program specificities through the specific annexes and rules to be applied for the specific projects. Next slide, please. Uh, now, how to calculate personnel uh, cost? The, uh, the formula is simple. You multiply the daily rate by the days worked on the project, rounded up, to, uh, rounded up or down to the nearest half day. Um, next slide, please. Uh, 
how to calculate the daily rate now. It's uh, the formula, it's uh, the actual personnel cost of the specific person divided by 215 days. The, the 215 days is fixed across all, all projects. So you will be using that magic figure across all your projects. The actual personnel cost for the period include social security contribution, taxes, other cost linked uh, to the remuneration, and uh, uh, if they arise from national law or the, employee, the employment contract uh, agreement. Uh, now, uh, you calculate per calendar year, and the calendar year starts from January until December each uh, year, except for the months that are running at, uh, for the end of the period uh, until the calendar year closes. So, uh, for that you use, a, um, you use a proportionate, you divide the 215 days by 12, uh, multiplied by the months uh, that uh, your uh, reporting period uh, it's, uh, uh, ends. I have an example in the next slide that uh, you can uh, see. Next slide, please. So, we have a researcher that uh, the reporting period ends started uh, September 2021 uh, and the reporting period ends March 2023. For 2021, we, we have the actual personnel cost divided by 215 times the days were per the, uh, for the period from uh, September 2021. For uh, 2022, we have the whole uh, period. And for 2023, we have the actual personnel cost divided by the uh, 215, uh, divided by 12 times 35, which is the days that he worked for the specific project. Uh, as I mentioned, Horizon, 20, uh, Horizon Europe follows the calendar year uh, on, uh, with regards to personnel cost, so no, no longer the, class, uh, the last close financial year applies. Your project year might not necessarily follow the calendar year, however, uh, when you are reporting, you will most likely um, end somewhere during the calendar uh, year. So, uh, you have an example here how it is uh, easily calculated. And uh, this is what you are going to include in your uh, reporting period for the Commission. Now, how you calculate, uh, next slide please, how you calculate the, uh, the day's work. You need to use reliable time uh, recording, uh, like uh, timesheets, uh, either on paper or on a computer-based, if your uh, organization has that. Uh, or you can uh, sign a monthly declaration on days spent for the specific action. The template is not yet available uh, on the Commission, but it's something that they are working on, and uh, soon they said it will be available on the uh, on the website. Okay, and I have to, to remind you, uh, you have a last two minutes. Yes. Time for uh, Asia, and we get uh, interesting question in the uh, yeah. box. I know. The time recording system in hours, you have three options. Either you a convention based on the average number of hours that the person must work per working day according to his or her contract, or a conversion of the on based on the usual standard annual productive hours, or you use a fixed number of hours uh, rounded to eight hours per day. Uh, I have examples on uh, each of the options available, so we can move to the next uh, slide, which is a minor change from Horizon 2020. Uh, the additional remuneration is um, discontinued. Now we, it's replaced with a project-based remuneration. The project-based remuneration applies uh, its um, it's uh, a usual remuneration of a legal entity under which the person receives supplementary payments for work done on specific project. This must be the usual practices of the organization. So it's uh, how it must be declared. It's actual remuneration cost 
uh, times they worked, uh, uh, the, the time worked for the specific person on no uh, end. Uh, it, um, it has a, a slight um, limitations on how it is applied as uh, it has to be on national uh, regulations. So uh, there is a lot to be seen and specific um, uh, on the model, uh, annotated model grant agreement, a lot will be explained there. I have some further examples how to calculate the project-based remuneration and the fallback option. And so you will see it in your, uh, when you receive the presentations. I pass on the floor to Peringe so that he can uh, continue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elena. <clears throat> I, I received some comments through the chat that uh, the sound quality wasn't too good when during my previous presentations. Uh, I'm trying a headset now. Uh, could anyone let me know if this works better? Yes, it's a better. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Well, thanks for telling me. <laughs> so I don't want uh, uh, this to be affected by the uh, uh, by the sound quality. Uh, Maria, are you seeing the, the correct window now for my presentation? Yes. Great, mm -hmm. thanks. Okay, so how to budget personal costs then uh, in light of uh, the changes that uh, Elena has explained? Uh, first of all, uh, in the grant agreement budget, uh, as opposed to the proposal template budget, you actually have subcategories of personal costs. Uh, and these are summarized here in a different layout than from what you have in the, in the grant agreement. Uh, as again, uh, again, when you uh, submit the budget for the proposal, you just have one column saying personnel cost. But actually, you do have various subcategories. And in the grant agreement, uh, they are relevant. And I'm summarizing those here. Uh, just uh, linking back to what, uh, one of the earlier presentations, seconded persons means persons that are contributed by a third party against payment. Uh, SMEs may actually have a combination of uh, SME owner, uh, which is a unit cost-based uh, calculation, as well as any of the other categories. Uh, just to keep that in mind that if you have an SME and they declare a cost based on the unit cost for SME owners that don't receive a salary, they may also have costs in the other personnel categories. Uh, the changes uh, from Horizon 2020 to Horizon Europe, what do they mean for budgeting? I would argue that the switch from hourly rates to daily rates do not have a significant impact when you budget for the proposal. Uh, most uh, entities, when they participate in the framework program and most consortia, they plan not on an hourly basis and they don't plan on a daily basis. They plan in terms of person months. And I would argue that when you estimate the cost per person month a few years into the future, it doesn't matter whether you have to report later on based on hours or days. Uh, I'd be interested to hear if anyone disagrees with me, but uh, that is, uh, and there may be exceptions, but I think for most of us, it doesn't really matter when you budget for the proposal. Uh, the other thing that does matter is the rules on project-based remuneration. So for those that uh, use that or for whom it, it is relevant, Keep in mind uh, the rules and, and the ceiling, uh, the, the, the rule that says that you have to use the lower of the so-called action daily rate or on the one side uh, or the national projects daily rate on the other. Uh, so that does, does have an impact on, on the budget. Um, so when you are a uh, beneficiary and you're going to calculate your personal costs for uh, a proposal for Horizon Europe, what should you think of? First of all, you should assess whether your organization qualifies for using the actual cost option or the unit cost option. Unit cost it means uh, the same cost for a category of personnel, basically. Uh, the other thing that you should think about is whether you would use any personnel that go under the category natural person under direct contract or seconded person. And as I said earlier, if you are an SME, 
uh, keep in mind that you could have a combination of an SMB owner who does not receive a salary and works on the project, which might be reimbursed on the unit cost basis, as well as the other personnel cost uh, uh, we, we have three minutes uh, more until the end of this session. You yeah. have one minute for conclusion, please. Yeah. So use a consistent methodology to include a realistic estimate on salary increases as long as the project lasts. And if you're a non-Euro Euro country, also use a realistic estimate for uh, exchange rates during the implementation period. Um, as a coordinator, I would suggest that you should uh, collect from your partners when you uh, in the proposal stage, the information as to which of those personnel categories uh, their costs are for. And that is based on the tip that was issued for applicants for the EIC Pathfinder open call uh, last month, which said that for the grant preparation stage, you need to have a key, clear track of which of those categories the personal costs belong to for all of the partners in the consortium. Uh, this is, uh, you can look at it later, a suggestion on how to approach developing your own budget tools, depending on how many and how many proposals you expect to submit and how many different uh, work programs and calls you expect to submit uh, proposals for. Uh, as I said, I think we'll just end there. Okay, okay uh, Peringa, I'm so sorry, I, I have to stop you here uh, because we we will we should try to answer at least one or two questions from a chat box. Uh, for example, uh, yes, so first uh, uh, question is how, you know, uh, do we have uh, to make timesheets instead of declaration? on a person's work exclusively on Horizon 2020 action when a postdoc 100% uh, uh, fully hired for the project uh, is on a sick leave during the few days, uh, weeks or months. It is better to keep time sheets or a declaration, whatever uh, the, uh, the uh, commission allows both of you, uh, both of them. So in order, in case of an audit, you need to substantiate uh, the time that the person has worked on the specific project. Uh, because it happened to us uh, under Horizon 2020, it is better to have either a declaration or timesheet, even for the people that are working full time on a specific project. Okay, uh, thank you, Elena, uh, very much uh, uh, for uh, answer. Uh, there was a mistake in my, there was a typo on my slides that I will correct it and the slides that will be uh, disseminated will be corrected. So okay. okay, thank you very much uh, for all excellent presentation and discussions. Uh, we will uh, have uh, additional time to discuss financial rules tomorrow during the meeting. And uh, after the formal of the end of this uh, meeting, I completely agree with your comments that this topic personnel costs in uh, Horizon is very important, but this session is uh, just a brief overview about the main changes. We will have one additional session uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, after the event, we will uh, have the additional time for discussion, all unanswered questions uh, from finance. Uh, it is a very last session, uh, and in this session, we wish to get feedback from all of you about this event. Hopefully, we will have a time for discussion about position of finance in the future development of research management and administration as profession. Uh, now, we have to uh, move on a plenary link uh, to, uh, to hear what uh, uh, my colleague uh, want to, to say as closer remarks. Uh, we will uh, uh, take all your questions from chat. And uh, as I uh, say at the beginning, try to answer during the event or after the events in the writing. Uh, thank you and see you tomorrow morning again.